I was so sad. I was so frustrated and I was so depressive that when I went home after the hospital stay, I went to the couch in the living room and I didn't speak, I didn't eat and I didn't move for two weeks straight. All I wanted to do was to take my own life. All right, everybody worldwide, you're now tuned into Motivation and Confidence, where we help you do your daily best. And I'm your host, Tom Danger. This week, we have a special guest. Please tell the audience your name. Nathaniel Chudvik. <laughs> it's very cool. And tell us um, where you're from and what inspired you to spread your message throughout the world. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm living right now in Switzerland, in Zurich. And uh, yeah, so my purpose is to inspire people and help them to develop a victorious mindset. And I do that since about four years or uh, sorry, not four years, or about four years um, ago, 2016. And uh, so there is way more behind the purpose than four years and we will get into the story later on and I love to inspire people I love to uh, I believe in the power of words that we can choose the right powerful word to lift each other up and uh, that's why I become a speaker as well to back it up with practical steps to be a victorious mindset mentor okay very cool now do you have a book also I do have an ebook. Mm -hmm. uh, I count it as a book as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's uh, called Four Steps to Unlimit Your Life. And you will be able to get a hold at the end of the podcast um, to get a free hold of it on both of my websites. Okay. Okay. Now, tell us your story because it's very unique. And um, I, I, I must commend you for the strength and adversity that it has taken you to come thus far. So tell us about your journey and, and how you arrived to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I was one year old when I was diagnosed with an incredible chronic illness that affected my both of my kidneys. They got destroyed. And what that means is like if somebody didn't have kidneys, um, she or he has to go to to dialysis treatment, whether uh, either it's uh, every night or three times a week in the hospital. And so for me, it started every night when I was about two years old after my kidneys got removed. And um, this was the first time my parents had to decide between life and death. So they either could say, look, we are not going to take you on this difficult road of taking on the dialysis treatment because that is a huge of any parent, of any family that had to go through um, with a son or a daughter in that age. It, it's incredibly painful and incredibly burdening. And so that was the time when I was fortunate basically to that my parents decided to um, choose life life over dead on my life and uh, so we did that I had to do that in order to survive and it was the first time when everything started you know difficult it started to roll on um, different infections uh, many many tribulations and operations started to come on and that that went on for a couple more years until it went so bad when I was falling into a coma for about two weeks when I was three years old. And during those two weeks, um, at the end of those two weeks, the doctors called my parents and told them, hey, look, we have done everything we could do. There's nothing else we can do right now to help or improve your son's life. We are going to turn off... Um, the support 
life support machines that I was on during the coma. And so my parents come into the ICU at midnight or late at night to terminate my life. My parents spoke different words over, over my life before they basically farewelled my life. And there was the moment when the medical staff turned off the machines. And by the time, of course, medically seen, I should have been dead by that time, but it come otherwise. All of a sudden, I started to talk again to my parents. And that was huge because, so there's no um, reason I should have been talking or getting back to life because my brain was basically dead at that time when they turned off the life support machines. So I recovered from that for about, I might say about one month before I had to, to continue doing dialysis treatment. And there was one of the times where my family and especially myself saw a light in the long tunnel of my journey when we got a call from the medical staff that I get a kidney transplant. So what that meant was like, um, I get a transplant and I will live a normal life without dialysis, without uh, complications, uh, whatever I was um, dealing with. But unfortunately, this only worked for about 24 hours. And then they had to remove every, the kidney again and put me back on dialysis. What was wrong with the kidney? So the, yeah, the kidney was basically destroyed again by my chronic illness. And so it didn't hold that long as, as they expected. And uh, it was 24 hours. Um, I don't know the exact reason why it was only uh, like that short time. There was uh, another time where there was, especially for me again, as well for my family too, to have another light, to see a light in the long tunnel of, of difficulties when we got another call to get my second kidney transplant. And this was amazing because that time I was so flourishing. Uh, imagine a seven year old guy, boy, I learned basically everything that anyone does with one or two years old. I could learn how to feed myself, go out, play around, meeting friends, uh, other people. And this was just for a seven year old boy, it was like the dream, the dream life. Um, and I was so flourishing. Unfortunately, after two and a half years, the same thing happened as when I was five years old, my kidney got destroyed again by my incurable chronic illness. And I remember the time I was so disappointed, I was so sad, I was so frustrated, and I was so depressive that when I went home after the hospital stay, I went to the couch in the living room and I didn't speak, I didn't eat, and I didn't move for two weeks straight. All I wanted to do was to take my own life. And I was in my head, everything was in my head to just finish that life. I didn't understand why this happened to me. I didn't know how I'm going to get out of this. I didn't know how to, to if there will ever be any change after two failed kidney transplant and many, many operations at that time. But somehow by, um, I was fortunate to, to have a great family surrounded by great people that invited um, counselors and pastoral care to help me to, to work on, to get back on, on the strength. And I remember the, the time when, when um, at the time after that day, when, when they spoke life into, words of life into my life that anything changed. Step by step, I regained physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental strength. And of course, I still was deeply disappointed. 
I often had to force myself to get to the treatment. I had no choice I, I, because um, if I wouldn't have gone, I would have died within seven days or so. But I, I just had to push myself to go there. Um, it went very well, so I, I get back. I go back on on everything. Uh, try to figure out life and and knew that somehow I, I have to continue because the, the the interesting thing was like during the time I was doing the two weeks, there was a voice or during the two weeks of. Uh, wanting to take my own life, there was a voice of saying, hey, just keep going on for one day, one day after another. But there was also the other voice that said, hey, just finish that life. And so I was always in the tension in my mind. And I remember that clearly because I, I some days were so crazy that I couldn't get up or I, I didn't want to get up. But But yet after those two weeks, I realized, okay, I'm gonna keep going one day after another and see what's happening. And it went about one and a half years further away when I um, had my third kidney transplant, which was great again. I, for 13 months straight, I could live my beautiful dream life that I was always expecting or dreaming of as a child. Yet at the same time, I realized I have everything, well, I have everything that I have right now, but something is missing in my life. And for me, it was such a thing when I lose the kidney again to, to realize that maybe there's more to life than having a great health, a perfect health or anything that we, that we want to have in our life. Maybe there is something more, a purpose, a fulfillment, um, a greater peace or joy that we can, that we can um, uh, receive in our life. And from that day on, when I lost my kidney transplant, the third one, I decided that my life is based on the belief that I believe that everything, everything not just in my life, but in other people's life, that's what I believe for, that all things will work together for the good. No matter how painful it is, no matter how um, crazy it gets, and no matter how disappointing it is. And uh, interestingly, uh, it took me about four other years up to age 15, when things still got a lot of messy. But since 15 years old, I really can look back and say, hey, I got such a stabilized life, um, holding on, create, holding on to, to a better future, a better hope. And no matter what's happening during my time, uh, I will hold on that one day, everything will work out to the good. And now I'm, I'm grateful for having turned 32 years old this year. And I've seen shifting and transforming my life just because of a single belief and step by step changing my mindset to having a victorious mindset. And uh, that's what I love to do. And uh, not, not to boast here, about, but I have to tell you that um, according to the medical report, I shouldn't be able to walk, talk, amount to anything. I should, I should be dead six times by now. I had several, um, about 40 operations. And uh, so there was a huge, several depressions and burnout. Yet I believe that no matter how crazy it gets, no matter whether it gets crazy in a family, in your relationship, in a business, in your health, or in any other area in your life, there's always an opportunity to shift into a victorious mindset. So back at seven years old, when you were on the couch and two weeks and you were thinking about taking your life, what do you remember your family saying to you that gave you hope? Great question. 
Um, so my my parents always encourage me to to keep going and supported me. Um, Interestingly, it, it it was not necessarily the parents that that make the change, or the how do you say that? It wasn't the words of the parent that make the big change. I think it was more for me. I'm a person of faith, and I think it was more of a spiritual spiritual intervention. Mm-hmm. Of um, I believe in a God who had the control of our lives. And uh, I believe that it was just, you know, a spiritual intervention of a supernatural power. And, uh, you know, it's not like, ooh, wow, ooh, ooh. <laughs> it wasn't like that. It's just like, you know, God, I believe God meets us exactly in the perfect way that we need to have. And uh, we, we had pastors in our place, so they, they spoke a lot of, faith and prayers all my life and uh, I that I think it might not make naturally make sense but for me it it was one of the biggest transformation that I realized to shift again into you know emotional physical uh, mental and spiritual strength to keep going got you so you had your third transplant by 15 years old correct uh, 11 years, so it was nine and a half to 11 years old. Okay. At what point do you realize that you want to speak to help other people realize that there is a power greater than ourselves that can help you push forward? When did you realize that? Mm, I would say it wasn't a one-time event. I would say the the, the official start was like, I say it's four years ago, 2016. Um, but I have, before that, I have spoken every now and then, um, you know, in different locations and places. But I wasn't really intentional that I could use my story in a, in a way, greater way. And uh, so I would say 2016 was the final start when I said, okay, I'm going to leave everything behind that happened. What I'm doing right now, I'm going to start on a new chapter as a speaker. So as a speaker, can you take us back to the point when you had that first speaking engagement and what it felt like? Yeah, it was interesting. It was um, in a business in Australia, in Sydney. So I was living in Australia for four and a half years. And uh, so it was the very first speaking in front of, um, I think it was 60 business people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was weird because I was never speaking in a business environment. So I was not growing necessarily up in a, you know, in a business mindset family. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. everything was new, but I just had to to give it a go. And um, so I, I, I was... I was impressed as well, but not not the way I did it, but the way it was impactful. People started to cry and people started to, to come up to me to ask for help, to ask for answers. And I was like, well, here we go. I mean, um, if I can change at least one life, then I will have to, to continue. Nice. So when did you decide to form it as a company and turn it into a business? Um, it, it evolved over, you know, over weeks, over months. So it was funny. I was, I was starting with a simple website. and I was putting in my story in there. And then over the years, I was building up my website continually. I added one more, a business website last year. And so it didn't happen, you know. Everything happened over the last few years, step by step, every day, one little time, one little thing at a time. And uh, I think that's the beauty of our life because the big things don't happen in a, in a, you know, dynamic way. It happens in a, in a slow, consistently, every day, um, happy tool way that we that we keep going 
making changes every day in a small way. Okay. So with 20, but with, with today being the last day of 2020, as we're recording this podcast, um, there's been a lot of tragedies throughout the world that has happened. Um, what has 2020 meant to you? Great question. Um, for me, I think just to be patient. I think patient is the best word. Um, I had so many plans this year that didn't work out. I had a few goals that I, yeah, I could leave out, but but uh, the majority of of my of my 2020 was really being patient and just you know adjusting, um, adjusting. I would say adjusting to the game. Um, okay. Yeah, and th- this is what I learned. And to be honest, it wasn't. Um, I would say Corona was not not to pardon no problem not to be not to be sounding out of ground here but um corona was for me one of the one of the i don't know how to say one of the easiest way to deal um mm-hmm. because of there were so so many other things going on in my life especially emotionally um I'm, I'm, I'm struggling mostly emotionally and mentally at the moment because of my long time of being chronically ill, the way I grew up in some sometimes. And um, so there was there's just I think everybody everybody had a different journey. Mm-hmm. But I love what it does when we have crisis. We get so creative. We get we get so um, we rethink certain things differently in order to make a shift and go into another direction that will help you to figure out life even better in the future. And that's okay. what the beauty of the crisis. Nice. So as far as what are you doing for you to deal with what you're going through? Are you going to counseling? Are you seeking prayer? Are you leaning on your family? What are you doing for you to make sure that you're getting better? Yeah, great question. So for me, absolutely counseling. Um, By the way, this was one thing that I really had to learn this year. Um, I was hard on getting help Mm -hmm. (laughs) for most of my life. And uh, I want to encourage you to get out there and get help, get a counselor if you, or a coach or a mentor if, if you feel like there's no other way to do it. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of uh, encouragement to, to show the weakness of ourselves. But the beauty of it is that once you do that, once, once I personally get into a counseling or as you say even I do prayers meditation then um things release you know things things release from the inside out and greater things can unfold mm-hmm. it's it's almost like some some part of your of of our life is it feels like we get a wall before us in the inside and we have to have someone else that destroys that wall in order to get, I would say, into the promised land that's behind the wall. And uh, I think we all are here for each other. Um, we, different people have different abilities, strengths, passion and values that can help us. And uh, so, yeah, I think that's the beauty of, of, of everything, to get help. Sounds good. Now, in your book, you mentioned your ebook. There were four steps that you mentioned. Can you go through those four steps, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the first, very first step is the question about who am I. So it's all about identifying who am I, and I want to make sure that I think it's more and more important that in a noisy world that we take time to ourselves. 
for ourselves and really identifying uh, things that are in there that the world doesn't know yet because we are we are so easily influenced by our environment and most of the time or most of our life i would say we leave somebody else cream or agenda or time or whatever and so this is the first step the second step is all about what am i here for so the question comes in turn so you don't just want to know who am i because that doesn't help anyone else. It helps you personally. But in order to, to get that beautiful strength, passion, and values that you have that are unique in your constellation to get into this world, um, we have to ask, what can I do? Or what am I here for, for this world? And within those questions, as I already mentioned, you um, have the opportunity to identify your strengths, passion, and values, which leads you to the third question that you can create a dream out of those words that you have identified. And the fourth step is all about um, being or stepping into the dream that you have created and consistently adjusting, um, you know, every daily getting mentoring and uh, getting different changes to make in order to to get where you want to go what what you want to have and who you want to be and that is the ebook for steps to unlimit your life nice so my question for you now is um is your purpose in alignment with your passion or are they two separately different things right now it's definitely aligned with it uh, i think okay. i think it's important that we do what we what is in us you know we i think we um we have way more in us than we than we um than we uh, can ever imagine and as soon as we do what we what is in us i think it aligns with our purpose and our passion and that's where we truly flourish and that's why we have the most successful life and fulfilled life not in a way you know to to really strive for it but more in a way to really um in a relational way if that's even a word <laughs> uh relational way and uh to to really enjoy life at the same time and not okay. doing something that that's crazy or striving for it that you don't even like to do. And that I think that's very important to, to, to go back to, to ourselves, to identify what we have in us. Nice. So what do you do for fun? Um, so this is fun. So I like to inspire people. I love to travel. Uh, if I can connect speaking with traveling even better. Um, I love to, yeah, I love to, to I, what I really love is to, to talk with people really deep about deep stuff, you know, okay. really deep stuff. Uh, I love doing sport, exercising, um, reading a lot, learning new things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, every day trying to, to see what I can, what I can do better at chess. I, I love a lot of personal growth that I do. And so this is a little bit the package that I love to do and what I do so, for fun. So what is the last book that you read? Uh, haven't finished it, but uh, it's a uh, healthy emotional spirituality. Okay. And okay. Uh, last week I finished, I don't remember even, <laughs> so. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, can you give everybody your website and social media handles and all that good stuff? Yeah, sure. So my personal website is nathanielturbuk.com and okay. my business website is um, unlimitedu.co. So there on both of the websites, the free ebook that you can download, download anytime, at anywhere. And uh, yeah, keep in touch. Like send me an email if you need it. 
um, I always say like I, I like I like to to get in touch personally with people, not necessarily on social media. So get a hold of the ebook. Uh, if you need help, send me an email. If you have any question, do the same, and uh, I would love to hear from you. Sounds good. Now, do you also do um, coaching and professional development? Yes. Yeah, so I do my not mentoring, which okay. is part of the. Uh, for me, it's more like mentoring than coaching. Okay. Yeah, I do that with clients, different clients from around the world. Okay. And is there a particular um, category that or problem that you solve or person or group that you deal with? I would say it's more about uh, the victorious mindset mentoring. So it's all about um, helping people um, deal, going through those four steps to unlimit their life. And so whether they are on the first steps to have, having to find out, identifying who they are or what they are here for, or anyone maybe that knows already that, but doesn't know how to deal with those answers that they got of those questions, uh, still there's the opportunity where I can help you to create a dream. And after that, there's still the opportunity where I can help you to, to really step into the dream and mentoring you along the way to uh, make the most out of it, out of your unlimited potential. Sounds good. And thank you, Nathaniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's a, a pleasure meeting you and you have an amazing story. And uh, please keep in touch so we can follow you along on your journey. 